Good day, brothers and sisters. Today is the Lord's Day once again, and we are so thankful to God for this blessed opportunity to be able to praise and worship the Lord once again. I'd like to share to you from the Gospel of John, chapter 21 and verses 24 to 25. It says, This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. John the Beloved is saying to us here that if he recorded all the miracles that Jesus performed, not all the books that would be written would contain everything that Jesus performed. Now, obviously, this might have been a hyperbole that John the Beloved was sharing to, to us when he wrote this down. But what he really meant was that uh, he lost count of the many miracles that Jesus had performed. And when I think about this and when I meditate on what this is trying to say and relate it to what has happened to our own lives and our own existence, we see that the Lord has performed so many blessings, so many things in our lives that we can no longer count them. And I think we need to change our mindset most especially during these very difficult times because oftentimes what has happened is we're counting our trials, our problems, our worries, our anxieties, our depression. That's what we're counting. The Bible says, however, that we need to renew our minds. Paul says in uh, the book of Philippians that our mind must dwell on things that are lovely, things that are pure, things that are noble, things that are excellent. These are the things that we need to focus on. And part of that has to do with counting the many blessings that God has performed in our lives. And there are many. Food on the table, drink that quenches our thirst, a roof on top of us, our, our, our health, or our getting cured of a sickness. There are just so many things that... God has done in our lives the love of the family, the love of our children, the love of a spouse. There are just so many things that God has done. So instead of counting the trials in your life, count your blessings. And as you count your blessings, worship the Lord. Shall we all rise from our seats and let's worship God. Emmanuel, God with us. 
creation sings, every nature shouts of your wondrous works, O oh Lord. Oh, glory to our King. Oh, glory to our King.
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Our sermon can also be heard over DYFR FM 98.7 every Saturday and Sunday at 8 p.m. Good news, brothers and sisters, Enough is Enough is making a comeback in our church right now. And we are selling it again at 275 pesos here in our church. And you can get a copy right now and share it among your friends. We have great news. We are happy to announce that we now have our very own Living Word online bookstore. Your favorite Living Word discipleship materials are now available for download straight to your devices. For a very minimal fee of 100 pesos only, you can now avail of the electronic copies in PDF format. Our Ephesians Volume 1 and Volume 2 are ready for your download. The Journey series, Knowing Christ, is now available online as well. And likewise, we have free study materials like More Than Enough Study Guide, Enough is Enough Study Guide. To avail and for more details, please visit books.com livingword.ph Stay tuned as we make more of our discipleship materials available on our online bookstore. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-000006-0800. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234811. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless. We will now be concluding our short series which we entitle The War against hypocrisy. We will read our text once again, Matthew 3, verses 7 to 12. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me 
is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you, Lord, for this blessed time you've given us, O God, so that we might be able to study your word once again. Indeed, Lord, we are a blessed people, blessed because you have given us the truth of God's word, the truth that has set us free, the truth that sanctifies us, and the truth that gives us hope. And so once again, Lord, speak to us through your word. I pray for myself as your vessel, that you will supply me, Lord, your anointing, so that your people might be able to understand your word, and that you might minister to them, not only as a corporate body, but even as individuals. And Lord, whatever is going to be achieved today, we will give you back the glory, the praises, and the thanks. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. Last weekend, we talked about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and we said that this group of people happened to be the hypocrites of their time. What is quite interesting, of course, is that they belonged to the religious elite of that time, and yet there was no inner reality nor substance to their faith. Take, for example, the Pharisees. The Pharisees happened to be the conservative Orthodox people of that time, and yet they were more concerned about ceremonies and rituals, and the motive was really to gain the approval of people so that they would become popular. And then you have the Sadducees, most of whom, of course, belong to the priestly uh, caste. And yet, a lot of them were really anti-supernaturalists. They did not believe in miracles. They did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the existence of angels. And then they were really fixated with materialism. And they even thought that because they were wealthy... God had blessed them. They were into religious business. And we know for a fact that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ actually hated their uh, religious enterprises, which caused people to uh, somehow draw back in their worship because the offerings that they were selling were quite expensive. But you know, if we really think about it, Uh, Religious hypocrisy is still present in the 21st century. And I guess that will remain true for a long, long time until the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, comes again. And so let me share to you a little story. There was an Irish priest who visited New York uh, for the very first time. And he went to a place which was called the Bowery. And when he visited this place, and by the way, this place was the place of uh, the homeless people, as well as those who were um, very much steeped into drugs and alcohol. And so when he went to that place, it so happened that he felt a gun on the side of his ribs. And the person said, give me all your money. And so the priest took his wallet and emptied, emptied the wallet, And what happened was the whole dopper realized that he was was a priest. And so therefore, he was greatly embarrassed that he was taking money from the priest. And he said, Father, please forgive me. I did not know that you were a priest. And so the priest said, it's all right, my son. I forgive you. Just repent of your sin. Now, why don't you grab a cigar? And so the priest offered a cigarette, and the whole dopper said, 
I'm sorry, Father, I don't smoke during Lent. So that's a rather funny story. But the truth of the matter is that we see that very often, even here in our own country. There is so much religiosity, but there is no true godliness. And this is the reason why John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ were at war with these hypocrites. Why? Because they somehow presented a wrong side of religion. And by doing that, they were really setting the standard for people. And obviously, this was something that Jesus and the Lord, uh, rather, the Lord Jesus Christ and John the Baptist did not like to happen. And so we will expound now on the passage that we have. And just as a little review, we will go back to the outline. So the first point was the radical herald's message to the religious hypocrites, which we found in verses 7 to 10. And then in verse 7 to 8, the false assumption and truth to act upon. Verse 9, the false security and the truth to believe in. Verse 10, the false believer's impending judgment. And then our second major point was the radical herald and the radical king, verses 11 to 12. We find in verse 11, the radical herald's ministry. And then in verse 11, the radical king's greatness and ministry. In verse 12, the radical king's judgment and reward. So let's dive in and we will continue with the false believer's impending judgment in verse 10. Shall we read verse 10 again? It says, The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, just by looking at this particular passage, you can already read into the text that this speaks of judgment. And one of the things that the Old Testament declares to us is that when Messiah would come, Messiah would be judging those who are un unrighteous. And this is something that we find in some passages in the Old Testament, which I would like to share to you. For example, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4, it says, But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. So we are given here a picture of the Messiah by Isaiah himself, and the picture here is that of a judge. So the Messiah would bring judgment upon unrighteous Israel and upon the unrighteous people of the world. And again, this is a theme that we find in the Old Testament. And so the Messiah would not just come to bring deliverance, he would also be judging people. And what does this tell us? This tells us that the Messiah would represent the holiness and the justice of God. So God is not merely concerned about bringing about political or military deliverance. And sadly, the people of Jesus' time thought only of that ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the ministry of deliverance, political, and military as well. And this is the main reason why eventually, they had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, they did not understand that because God chose them to be a holy nation, because God chose them to become his treasured possession, they should somehow represent his holiness and righteousness. And at that particular time, there was so much hypocrisy and there was so much religiosity, but no godliness whatsoever. Now, continue on, continuing on with other passages, let's go to Isaiah 61 and verses 1 and 2, and here is what it says. 
It goes, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, and watch this, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. So clearly, these passages in the book of Isaiah tell us that God would come and he would come with judgment. And by the way, this is not, uh, these are not the only passages that you will find in the Old Testament. There are many more. But I think for our purposes, this would be quite sufficient already. And this was really the message of John the Baptist when he said that the axe is laid at the roots. And basically, that means ready for action. Ready for action. Ready to act in judgment. And this is the reason why John the Baptist was calling the people to repentance, including the Pharisees and the Sadducees as well. Now, of course, we know that John the Baptist, together with the Lord Jesus Christ, used imagery that the Jews were quite familiar with. And of course, the imagery that we often see here would be that of uh, shepherding, livestock, and that of agriculture. In this particular case, of course, the picture that we are given is a picture in agriculture. What would happen is when farmers would go out into their fields, they would begin to examine the vineyards as well as the trees. And upon examination, the vineyards, or the vine rather, the vine and the trees that did not produce fruit, they would cut down and they would uproot. In fact, they would eventually throw it into the fire and have them burn. The logic, of course, in doing this is that uh, these non-bearing vines and non-bearing uh, trees should not take the nutrients of the land. So the purpose was so that the fruit-bearing uh, trees as well as vines would be able to get all the nutrients. And so here, what we discover here is that John the Baptist was saying is that God will make a distinction. The Messiah will make a distinction between those who are righteous and those who are unrighteous, those who are fruit-bearing and those who are not really bearing spiritual fruit. So the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would make that distinction and therefore he would make a judgment on the basis of what he sees, not only externally, but what he sees in the hearts of men. And I think it's very important to realize who the person of Jesus is to us. Because oftentimes we recognize the goodness of the Lord, the loving kindness of the Lord, the love of the Lord, the mercy of God, the grace of God, and so on and so forth. And we forget another dimension of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is that of holiness, which is that of justice. And we have to accept the totality of the person of Jesus Christ. He is not only a God of love, but he is also a God of holiness and a God of justice. And therefore, judgment and justice is part of his ministry. Aside from deliverance, which could be in the future, military, as well as political, but of course, in our day and time, what we are seeking for is that of spiritual deliverance. And that was what he was offering, by the way, to the people of Israel at that time, but they did not catch it. They did not understand the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it also says here that the tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Of course, when we speak about fire coming from the scriptures, fire is a purifying um, instrument uh, used by the Lord. 
But most probably, what is in mind here is God's judgment. I think within the context of fire being used as a symbol of judgment is probably the more accurate uh, interpretation. And so once again, what we discover here is that ultimately, the Lord Jesus Christ would not only act as Savior, but ultimately, He will also act as judge. And of course, if you understand the timeline and the eschatology of things, you understand that ultimately the judgment will be at the great white throne. Right after the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a resurrection of the unrighteous dead, and they will all be judged by God. They will be thrown into the lake of fire. And so it will be a literal fire People will be tormented from everlasting to everlasting with an everlasting fire. So I believe when we recognize that, and when you and I are trying to consider the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should somehow have in mind the fact that we are eternal beings. The question, of course, is where will be our landing place. Will it be in heaven or will it be in hell? And of course, the way we see Jesus largely will determine how or where our landing place would be. And that is why, of course, with everything that is happening, I have somehow been intentional in sharing the gospel to people making people realize that there is an eternity to prepare for. And if you are not prepared for eternity, I pray that you might recognize that this Jesus is not only offering salvation to us at this time, but eventually, if we reject Him as our Lord and Savior, He will be the judge of our souls. And the time to repent is here and now, not tomorrow, because delaying might really be disastrous for us. One of my pastor friends, uh, Pastor Norman Abadilia, was sharing to us during a conversation with our CCM community. He said that in so far as he was concerned, 15 people whom he knows died in the past Uh, recent uh, months of COVID-19, 15 people. And and can you imagine that? I mean, in in just a matter of probably a couple of months or a few months, uh, his friends, 15 of them, 15 people whom he knew died of COVID-19. And you and I know that it's coming close to home. This pandemic crisis is coming close to home because previously we were just talking about statistics. We were just talking about numbers. But now we're not talking about numbers. We're talking about faces. We're talking about names. We're talking about familiar people who are dying. And the big question, of course, that I have to ask you is this. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Because that was the ministry of John the Baptist. The ministry of John the Baptist was to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah. To prepare them to receive Jesus into their lives. And some way, somehow, we are all heralds of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most especially if you happen to be a minister of the church, if you happen to be a member of the church, you have an obligation. You have this duty and privilege to share the gospel to as many people as possible to prepare their hearts so that they could receive Jesus into their lives. So let's talk about the radical herald and the radical king right now in verses 11 to 12. First of all, let's talk about the radical herald's ministry. And John recognized that in verse 11, he says, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. So what John the Baptist was really saying here to us is that his ministry was merely 
preparatory. What he was really trying to bring before the people was an outward symbol in which the Lord Jesus Christ would bring about that inner reality. What John really wanted to happen was for people to make this outward profession of baptism, but accompanied by genuine inner repentance, which would make them ready to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord, Savior, and Messiah. And once again, I believe that we likewise, just like John the Baptist, have that duty and privilege to present the people before, uh, to present to the people the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that, our desire, of course, is that they might repent of their sins and they, they might come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 11, we find the radical king's greatness and ministry. It says, But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, once again, what John the Baptist was doing, of course, is as he was communicating to the audience of that time, he was using a familiar imagery. And in this particular case, he was using the imagery of a slave. When his master would arrive, what a slave would do is he would normally take off the sandals and wash the feet of his master. That is what he would do. It was the job of the lowliest slave, by the way. And you know what? What John the Baptist was saying here, John the Baptist was saying, I'm not even worthy. I'm not even deserving to wash the feet of my master. And you know what? If we really understand the holiness of God, if we really understand the perfection of God, if we really understand the glory of God, and if we likewise recognize our own sinfulness, our own helplessness, our own spiritual helplessness and hopelessness, and when we compare ourselves, our own lives, our own heart, with the heart of hearts of God, we recognize how totally undeserving you and I are. And friends, that was the kind of feeling that, the John, the, that John the Baptist had. He just, he just had this realization that he was absolutely unworthy. Now, by him saying that, he was recognizing the transcendence of the person of Jesus Christ. By saying that, he was implicitly saying that this being, this person I am going to present to you is not an ordinary human being. In fact, implied in this is the fact that Jesus was a divine, eternal being, that he himself was God, that he himself is the second person in the Blessed Trinity. That was the implication of what John the Baptist was saying here. Because, again, let us recognize the tribute that Jesus had with John the Baptist when he said that John the Baptist happened to be the greatest of Old Testament prophets, and yet this greatest of the Old Testament prophets recognized the transcendence of Jesus Christ. And this speaks about the greatness of this person. And again, just to read this to you, read verse 11, it says, But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, Jesus' ministry and person was not only greater than John the Baptist because he happened to be the Messiah, but 
we have to likewise understand that he was greater in person and in ministry because he was a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit baptizer. Jesus would baptize the people with the Holy Spirit. And just by that statement alone, we recognize not only the uh, greater ministry of Jesus Christ, but the transcendence of his very person. And incidentally, when you go to the Old Testament, this was really part of God's new covenant with his people, Israel. And that is why we see oftentimes that in the Old Testament, the ministry of the Messiah was accompanied by the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that you can check out uh, in the Old Testament books as well. Now, the word he in he will baptize you happens to be a contrast emphasis in the Greek, which tells us that only Jesus and nobody else would baptize with the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus is the Holy Spirit baptizer. And again, uh, having said that, we recognize the transcendence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we recognize the fact that for him to be able to do that, he must be a higher person. He was not an ordinary human being. In fact, he happens to be the Son of God, the second person in the Blessed Trinity, and only he had the right to be uh, the Holy Spirit baptizer. And this is what we see. Now, What's the purpose of baptism? The purpose of baptism was to identify the true people of God. We find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, wherein it says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So, when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, we are baptized into the body of Christ. That makes us members of God's house household. That makes us sons and daughters of God. And so the Holy Spirit happens to be our identifying mark. We are identified as God's people. And so obviously, only those who have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, belong to God. And that's something that Paul makes clear in the book of Romans when he says that if you have the Holy Spirit, then you belong to God. But if you do not have the Spirit of Christ within you, you do not belong to Him. So the Holy Spirit is the authenticating, validating mark that you and I belong to God, that you and I are genuine sons and daughters of God. And oftentimes when I go and preach um, to certain groups that I'm not sure if they happen to be true or genuine believers in Christ, one of the questions that I ask them is, do you have the assurance that you have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And I often tell them, the reason I ask you this question is that it is the Holy Spirit that makes us true and genuine sons and daughters of God. Without the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, we are not really children of God. And you know, whenever I ask that question, it makes people think. And I think it is very relevant to ask that question, most especially here in the Philippines, because everybody thinks that they are believers. Everybody thinks that they are Christians. Everybody thinks that they are sons and daughters of God. And we have to be able to ask them the question, do you have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit? And by the way, it is the Spirit of God that bears witness that we are children of God. 
It is the Spirit of God that, that gives us that inner conviction that we belong to God, that we are His sons and daughters. Now, obviously, if you do not have the witness of the Holy Spirit in your heart, that should somehow create a question mark in your mind. Am I truly a child of God? And once again, this is a question that I pose to all of you who are watching me right now. Are you sure that you are a child of God? And to be sure that you are a child of God, you have to recognize, first of all, that you are a sinner. And not only a sinner, but a sinner who is helpless and hopeless to save himself. And not only that, you recognize that none of your good works will bring you to heaven. In other words, your full reliance is on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Your full reliance is on the person of Jesus Christ and whatever he has done in Calvary. That is what you trust that his blood will cleanse and wash you from all your sins. So once again, let me ask you this question. Have you ever come to that realization such that you have surrendered your life to Christ and you have made him your Lord and Savior? And if you have done that, do you have the witness of the Holy Spirit in your heart? that you are a child of God. Unless you are baptized by the Holy Spirit, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, you cannot claim to be a child of God. And my prayer for you is that as you listen to me right now, you would make that step of faith to receive Christ in your life. Because you know what? In these very treacherous times, you never know when God will take you home. And the question is, are you prepared? Having the Holy Spirit is what will assure us that we have a place in the life to come. And that is why we will not fear death itself. Because as the book of Hebrews says, one of the things that God has conquered is that he has conquered in us the, the slavery of the fear of death. Why? Because what Jesus has to offer is eternal life for those who make him their personal Lord and Savior. And therefore, they have the assurance of salvation. I, I like what um, Rabin Dranath uh, Tagore said, Death is not extinguishing the light. It is only putting out the lamp because the dawn has come. And then allow me to quote uh, something to you uh, from somebody. I forgot who the author of this was, but a lot of great uh, spiritual nuggets that you can take out of this. This is what he said. I've learned something through all my experiences that every exit is also an entrance. Every time you walk out of something, you walk into something. I got into this world by dying in the womb, and it must have been painful to get ripped out of that familiar place. But that was the prerequisite of my getting into time and space. You know, at the end of my life in history, there's going to be a similar kind of transition experience. And if we can get at the terror of death by saying it is a transformer rather than an annihilator, then also we can get rid of the idea that death is a thief and is taking something that is rightfully ours, which is the basis of all the rage that I know. So again, quick lesson here. You just have to know, are you saved or not? Do you have the assurance of eternal life or not? Because we will all make that transition. I like what this author said. When you get out of something, you're walking into something. 
Now, the big question is, what will you be walking into? Let me share to you another story. Not too long ago, James Gordon Gilkey, one of the Christian leaders in Portland, Oregon, was told by his physician that he had fallen victim to an incurable disease. There was no possible way by which death could be averted or even long delayed. When this man heard the news, what did he do? Here is his own account of the hours which followed. I walked out to my home five miles from the center of the city. There I looked at the river and the mountain that I loved. And then, as the twilight deepened, at the stars glimmering in the sky, I said to them, I may not see you many times more, but river, I shall be alive when you have ceased your running to the sea. Mountain, I shall be alive when you have sunken deep into the plain. Stars, I shall be alive when you have fallen into the sea. What a blessed assurance this man had that when his time would be up, when God would take him home, he knew that he would outlive everything in creation. He would outlive the rivers. He would outlive the mountains. Why? Because Jesus Christ has given him the free gift of eternal life and the free gift of salvation. Having said that, however, notice here, again, going back, to the radical king's greatness in ministry, it says here in verse 11, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and then it says, and fire. Now, fire here, if uh, applied to believers, could be uh, could mean a purifying uh, agent. Obviously, that might mean sanctification if you happen to be a believer. But again, within context, it could also mean judgment. And so, again, the question is, who is Jesus to you? If Jesus is Lord and Savior to you, then eternal life is your destiny as you get baptized with the Holy Spirit. But if you reject Christ, then the judgment of God will be upon you. Let's now go to verse 12 as we talk about the radical king's judgment and reward. In verse 12, it reads, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Now, once again, um, John the Baptist was using imagery that people at that time were quite familiar with. So again, this is a, uh, um, a fam familiar imagery in agriculture. So allow me to give you a little background. In Palestine, as in many other parts of the ancient world, farmers made a threshing floor by picking out a slight depression in the ground or digging one if necessary, usually on a hill where breezes could be caught. The soil would then be wetted and packed down until it was very hard. Around the perimeter of the floor, which was perhaps 30 or 40 feet in diameter, rocks would be stacked to keep the grain in place. After the stalks of grain were placed onto the floor, an ox or a team of oxen would drag heavy pieces of wood around over the grain, separating the wheat kernels from the shaft or the straw. Then the farmer would take a winnowing fork and throw a pile of grain into the air. The wind would blow the shaft away while the kernels being heavier would fall back to the floor. Eventually, nothing would be left but the good and useful wheat. 
So what we find here is that the grain or the wheat would be separated from the shaft. Now you and I know that the shaft would be practically worthless and eventually it would be burned up. On the other hand, the grain or the wheat uh, speaks about the life germ, which symbolically speaks about people who have in their possession eternal life. So again, what will happen here is that there will be a segregation between the believers and the unbelievers. A segregation between those who are sons and daughters of God and those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there will be a separation. And again, this tells us that judgment time will happen. Judgment time will take place. And there will be a distinction between those who accepted Christ and those who rejected Christ. Those who accepted Christ will enter into the eternal joys of heaven. And those who rejected Christ will enter into the torments of hell. So again, the choice really is yours. And God is offering eternal life to whomever would receive it. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, it also says here that the grain and the wheat would be placed in the barn. And the barn here obviously represents um, eternal uh, salvation or the assurance of eternal life or eternal security. And that is what the Lord offers. God wants us to be with Him. That is the desired will of God. As the book of Timothy says, he does not desire for anyone to perish, but for us to receive eternal life. That is the desire of God. The question, of course, is do you desire it? And again, the Lord is giving you a choice. Now, in this particular passage, John the Baptist is portraying Jesus as the Savior to those who would accept him. But likewise, John the Baptist portrays him as a judge to those who would reject him. I recall a little anecdote, and the story goes something like this. A story is told that an Indiana cemetery has a tombstone more than a hundred years old which bears the following epitaph. Pause, stranger, when you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. Now, there was an unknown passerby who read those words and underneath scratched this reply. To follow you, I am not content until I know which way you went. I'd like to repeat that. To follow you, I am not content until I know which way you went. So the question I would like to ask as we close this sermon is, are you prepared? If for some reason... God takes you home sooner than you expected. Are you ready? Where is your landing place? Is it going to be heaven? Or is it going to be hell? The fact that you might deny that there are places like this will not somehow obliterate and annihilate the existence of these places. Jesus testifies that there is a heaven and that there is a hell. And the big question, of course, is, who is Jesus to you? 
If Jesus is Lord and Savior of your life, then you will enter the bliss of heavenly joys. On the other hand, if you reject him, then what awaits you is torment, an everlasting torment in the lake of fire. And I pray that will not happen to you. So right now, as we come to a close, if somehow this message has touched you and you're now beginning to really think about eternal, your eternal destiny and you're not sure that you are a child of God, there are just a few things that you have to recognize. Recognize that you are a sinner. Recognize that your good works cannot save you because the standard of God is perfection. And you will never ever be able to live a perfect life. Recognize that only Jesus and Jesus alone can save your soul because He alone performed the perfect sacrifice and only His perfect blood without spot and without stain and without blemish can cleanse you of all your sins, past, present, and future. And so if you want to receive the forgiveness that comes from Jesus Christ, if you want to surrender your life to Him, come before the Lord. Pray, pray before Him right now. And the Bible says, you shall receive the free gift of eternal life. You can do that right now, wherever you are. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for the people who are watching right now. And Heavenly Father, if there are some who have not received you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you might touch their hearts and that they might come before you and repent of their sins and make Jesus the Lord and Savior of their lives. Thank you, Lord. And today, Lord, um, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And Lord, prepare our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us now read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and following. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Once again, we celebrate the Lord's table. And as we celebrate the Lord's table, um, recognize that this is a celebration exclusively only for those who understand that salvation is a free gift. And if you understand that it is a free gift given only as you make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, you are free to join us in celebrating the Lord's table. And incidentally, um, John Calvin himself somehow endorsed and somehow encouraged the people to celebrate the Lord's Supper even in their own homes. And because of this pandemic crisis, we are not able to gather together as a body to be able to gather uh, and, and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. But again, um, using the example that uh, John Calvin uh, used in Geneva, we can celebrate the Lord's Supper in the privacy of our own homes for as long as we maintain the solemnity of this occasion. Let us remind ourselves, the bread symbolizes the body of Jesus Christ, which became our substitute. We were the ones who were supposed to be nailed to the cross, but Christ took our place. 
The wine symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses and washes us from all our sins. Let us now partake of the bread and the wine. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just praise you and thank you that we could celebrate your goodness and your salvation. And once again today, thank you, Lord, for the word of God, which truly blesses our hearts. We likewise thank you that we could share our resources, Lord, to be a blessing to the body of Christ as well as to extend your work. Whatever has been achieved today, we give you back the glory, the praises, and the thanks. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. It's been a wonderful Sunday um, morning once again. And so um, please continue to like and subscribe to our Facebook page and also our YouTube channel. It's been growing every week. And we're very happy that this is uh, taking place because we want to reach as many people as possible. And we also want to update you with our uh, video. So don't just like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please uh, uh, hit the notification bell so that every time we have a new video, we can uh, uh, update you regarding that. So my team, my wife Marie and my son AJ would like to say hi and goodbye. God bless you all. This pandemic crisis that you and I are in is not yet over. In fact, right now, a lot of people are becoming very, very worried because of the so-called Delta variant. And it's been quite sad that we are losing some people in our beloved Christian community. As of this time, here in Cebu, Six pastors have passed away as a result of COVID-19. And it's not just those pastors who passed away because of COVID-19. There are many others. And right now, there are ambulances that are lining up in the hospitals. A lot of people have been waitlisted. A lot of people have been suffering during these difficult times. And the suffering seems to have no end. Some of us are suffering health-wise. Some of us are suffering economy-wise. Some of us are suffering emotionally. Some of us are suffering socially. So there are many, many reasons why we as a people are going through very difficult challenges. And all the while we thought that this is going to be soon over, but it is not yet over. So the question, of course, that we would like to answer, or rather ask, rather, is where do I find hope? Where do I find consolation and solace for my soul? Well, I have good news for you, brothers and sisters. You and I know that the Bible inspires hope, the Bible inspires faith. The Bible inspires courage. And aside from that, we thank the Lord for literature that is quite helpful. And I'd like to announce to you that I have a brand new book, which I wrote together with other authors. And the title of this book is The Season of Grief. And this is all about stories that happened mostly during the time of the pandemic. People losing their homes, people losing their parents, people losing their jobs, people losing their children, and 
I would say that in the midst of all the crisis that all of the people went through, that I myself went through, I found hope in God. And this book, The Seasons of, of Grief, or The Season of Grief, will be able to provide that. You can buy a copy of this in our church or in any of the OMF bookstores. This is only for 275 pesos. You can order this book. God bless you all. Hi, this is Pastor Mel Caparos of Living Word Christian Church. One of the things that I've really been very thankful of, most especially in the past uh, three or four years, is being part of OMF Lit as an author. OMF Lit is a mighty instrument that God has used to bless not only our own nation, but likewise other nations as well. Through OMF, the Word of God has gone forth in different parts of this world and in different parts of the Philippines. People have been edified. People have been encouraged. People have been inspired by the many books that OMF Lit has produced and likewise distributed. And I happen to be one of those people whom God has used through uh, OMF Lit, to be a blessing to uh, many people, not only here in our country, but even abroad. And through OMF, I was able to write two books. One is this book, Enough is Enough, my very first book under OMF Lit. And this book talks about contentment. And this is a book I believe that a lot of people need to be able to read, read through. Why? Because many of us have many problems and some of us have not realized that the problems that we have, have come about because of greed, because of envy, because of discontent. And somehow, this book will help you navigate through your spiritual life and your journey so that it can guide you, help you, instruct you on how to be content. You know, there's nothing like a contented life. There is just a stillness and a calmness that you and I will have when you and I are content. We rest in God. We rest in Him because we know He is all-wise and all-loving. A second book that OM, OMF Lit has distributed and produced, of course, for me, is this book, More Than Enough. It talks about how to overcome our own trials. And you know, this 2020 and even this 2021 has been filled with so many trials. I mean, it's not just the pandemic crisis. There is unemployment. There's losing our own jobs. There's also the case of uh, uh, losing um, our social, you know, life because of the the thing that has caused us to to distance ourselves with each other, and so it has resulted in not only death because of the pandemic crisis. There's some people who committed suicide. There's some people who have done things that they now regret, and again. We need to be able to overcome our trials. This book, more than enough, will help you navigate through the trials of life. So please do not forget, enough is enough and more than enough. Thank you, OMF. You are such a blessing to us.